part of my new philosophy lately has been to bring more positivity to our coverage. I mean, certainly we have a responsibility to acknowledge and educate about problems, but we also want to highlight the good. That's going to be hard today. When we watched Intel's presentation on their new Core Ultra 200 desktop processors, our first thought was, boy, do these ever look familiar. And while we were impressed that AMD was able to achieve similar performance at significantly less wattage, not many of you were. Gamers don't want 5% improvement. They want FPS and they want it now. And well, kind of kills me to have to be the one to tell you this, but Arrow Lake is more like arrow through the heart because you're not even gonna get 5%, at least not across the board. The good news is that your power bill is gonna go down, but in many cases, so will your performance. So strap in for a very bumpy ride with me as I try to navigate what on earth is going on with CPUs in 2024. But first, a short layover to visit my at Segway to our sponsor. Ridge, their MagSafe wallets are back in stock. It's the Ridge wallet you know and love, but this time it attaches to your phone. Crazy! Check it out in the link in the description and pick one up today. Arrow Lake is full of changes, some of which are pretty radical. I mean, for starters, gone is SMT or hyperthreading, along with Intel's traditional monolithic die approach on the desktop. Instead, we get a tile-based architecture with the Foveros packaging that we first saw in Meteor Lake, and they're laying down clusters of SkyMont efficiency, or E-cores, between our now single-threaded Lion Cove performance, or P-cores. We also get four XE graphics cores on the iGPU tile that should be a lot stronger than Intel's previous attempts at integrated graphics, and while it clearly isn't on the level of AMD's 3D vCache chips, they have upped the level 2 cache per P core by 50%, from 2 megs to 3 megs. Wow! There's also been some big changes to core turbo behavior. More on that now! You thought I was going to say later, didn't you? We've got two chips with us today the Core Ultra 5 245K. That's a 6P core, 8E core chip that boosts to 5.2 and 4.6 gigahertz respectively. This is Intel's intended gamer sweet spot, at least for now. Then we've got the Core Ultra 9 285K. That gets 8P cores and double the E cores for a total of 24 cores. This one should be the productivity and also just do anything monster. It'll do 5.5 gigahertz on the P cores and 4.6 on the E cores, at least it sort of will, because the 285K has five, yes, five different boost frequencies depending on what you're doing. It technically can actually turbo up to 5.7 gigahertz, but that's only going to be a couple select cores in lightly threaded workloads. All right, thanks Intel. As for the last CPU, the one we don't have today, it gets 8P cores, but only 12E cores and a slightly slower clock speed. So far, so interesting. But how's it going to play out? For the folks shopping today, we wanted to compare Intel's own last gen, AMD's Ryzen 9000, and for the folks gaming on the top chips from the last couple of generations, we included AMD's most popular X3D chips. A couple of important points though, we decided to roll the latest Windows 11 24H2, and our 96 and 9700X chips are tuned to the new 105 watt TDP that AMD unlocked last month, and finally we didn't bother with the 5800X3D for productivity. That's a gaming chip. So. With that in mind, let's talk gaming performance. All of our tests were run at 1080p low to all but eliminate GPU bottlenecks and put as much pressure on these CPUs as possible. In City Skylines 2, not only do we see a decent improvement over 14th gen in both averages and 1% lows, but the 285K is beating everything in 1% lows. The only problem is it's crushing our 245K as well. It turns out in heavily multi-threaded games, this current generation gaming chip is looking decidedly last gen. It's not all bad news. We found some generational uplift in Total War Warhammer 3. It's not much, and also the 285K gets kind of stomped on by the 9700X in both averages and 1% lows, with the 245K trailing right behind. And that's it. That's the positive news for gaming. As we always say, look to multiple sources to paint the most complete picture, but for the rest of our suite, the results are very disappointing. Shadow of the Tomb Raider has the 245K in last place, clearly losing to its predecessor, the 14600K, with the 285K not doing a whole lot better. Our X3D chips crush it in averages, and even the vilified 9000 series chips from AMD come out ahead. 
But AMD is far from Intel's only enemy here. Even Intel's own 14700K is decently ahead of our new Core Ultra 9 in average FPS. Fortunately, that's not the case in Rocket League, but the 285K is still losing to its predecessor. It seems that this game doesn't care much about 3D vCache, but loves lots of cores and lots of threads, and is the only game we tested that placed the 9950X on top. And it's bad news again for the 245K, which found itself at the bottom of the list, coming up short to the old Core 5 again, both in averages and 1% lows. Yikes. And in Red Dead Redemption, we see another case where not only is AMD beating Intel into the ground, but 14th gen is right alongside getting in some kicks where it can. And F123 doesn't look a whole lot better. This is a massacre, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, sure, at least the 245K beat last gen in 1% lows, but that's it. And do you know what else beats last gen? Our new commuter backpack. It's got all the tech forward design you love from our OG backpack, but in a smaller, tighter package. Sign up for a notification at lmg.gg commuter or at the link down below. Moving on to Counter-Strike 2. Both new chips are solidly in the bottom three, with the 285K getting stomped yet again. At least we see an improvement with the 245K and 1% lows. Cyberpunk sees both doing okay for averages, but their abysmal 1% lows leave them buried at the bottom of the chart, not only being bested by their own previous generation, but also a two-year-old AMD chip running in an eight-year-old socket. Truly, this is a sad day for gaming, and therefore the world. Or is it? We asked Intel to tell us their top two and bottom two games that showcased their new power efficiency gains, and we tested them ourselves with the 285K. And while it's clear you're gonna see some huge swings in performance depending on what you play with these new chips, it is equally clear that you're going to see a reduction in power consumption across the board, something that Intel, unlike AMD, really needed to get under control with this generation. We'll touch a bit more on power and thermals later, but you can see here that yes, in Final Fantasy XIV Dawn Trail, we're losing 20% of our performance, but we're also dropping 40% of our power consumption. And Hitman? That was a similar story, with a 45% decrease in power for only a 13% loss in FPS. And those are the worst two. What about the best? In Civ 6, we've got a 35% power reduction while gaining almost 9% performance on the turn timer. And in F123, nearly 40% less power with 12% more average FPS. Don't get me wrong, guys. These are truly small slivers of silver on some very large cumulonimbus clouds, but they are there. This just in, Intel has informed us that despite claims of APO or application optimization being enabled by default on Arrow Lake, it was in fact off on the motherboard they sent us for our review. We've rerun the tests and discovered a small frame rate increase in CS2, essentially no change whatsoever in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and a decrease of about 10% in Red Dead Redemption 2's 1% lows. The rest of our games only saw a 1-2% to change, which could be attributed to run variants. Some of our productivity scores even went down slightly with the feature enabled. For the record, APO should be enabled by default on all boards, either in time for launch or shortly thereafter. I can't believe I'm still doing this character. It also appears that Windows 11 24H2 can have lower performance in games compared to other Windows versions. This is the version our testing used. But since 24H2 is publicly available, you may even be using it right now. We're standing by our results. If you want to learn more about the wide variety of performance you can expect, depending on which versions of Windows you're running, check out Hardware Unboxed coverage, as they tested the 285K on multiple Windows versions and power modes, showing some pretty big changes in FPS. Your mileage may vary. We're still not impressed with Arrow Lake when it comes to gaming. Back to you, Linus. I don't expect almost any gamer to look at this and think, I am very compelled to buy this product. But what I can hope is that, like we saw with AMD's Zen 1, that maybe this is the start of a long journey to recovery for Intel. Because if they can figure out what's going on with the games where they're getting absolutely dumpstered, productivity looks pretty okay. In Blender, there's a solid decrease in time taken to render for the 285K against the 14900K, and we get about a 10% improvement between the Core 5s as well. Unfortunately for Intel, the 9950X is still on top, but considering that the 245K beats both the 9700X and 9600X, I'm seeing this as a bright spot for Intel. 
a surprising one given the lack of hyperthreading on this new generation. Compiling with Godot sees more improvements for Arrow Lake 2, with our 245K once again beating the AMD 9700X. It may only have 6 P cores, but those E cores are really starting to show their strength now that we see them do more heavy lifting in multi threaded workloads. Intel has really invested in making these new Skymont E cores beefy to the point where they're really more like underclocked Raptor Cove P cores. In Handbrake, we see more improvements in AV1 encoding. The Core Ultra 9 sees a 22% uplift over last gen, with about a 15% uplift for the Core Ultra 5. Neither of them can crack the behemoth that is the 32 thread 9950X, but it is nice to see that the 245K isn't completely useless, trailing just behind the 9700X. X264 encoding is a similar story with smaller gains over previous gen on both chips, but hey, now our 245K is beating the 9700X by a hair, and we see very similar results in Prime Seed, with our 285K in second place and the 245K admirably beating its 9600X counterpart. Especially interesting in our results is Cinebench. The 285K finally lands on top of a chart in multi-core, and both Arrow Lake chips comfortably beat their 14th gen counterparts. The lack of P-core multi-threading and the extra E-core clusters really hurt the Core Ultra 5, but at least in single core, it puts on a respectable show, trailing just behind the 14900K. Just like in games though, the story here heavily depends on the workload, and we got just abysmal results in Puget Bench's Photoshop, with both new chips performing worse than last gen and straggling behind AMD by a wide margin. In Premiere, Intel is better than AMD, but this was already their fight to lose, and unfortunately, they managed it. <laughs> Arrow Lake doesn't even manage to beat their last gen 14th gen processor, so Pyrrhic victory? And 7-Zip is another disappointing loss in both compression and decompression. Womp womp. Can we maybe find some more silver? How about AI? I mean, after all, unlike AMD's most recent desktop offerings, these new Intel chips have NPUs. Ooh, neural processing. And at least when it comes to OpenVINO, we really see them shine with our 285K netting an 82% increase over the 14900K's CPU score in the same test. And since our 245K has the same NPU tile, it gets nearly the same score there as well, walloping the 14600K. Here we start to see what all the fuss is about with Intel's new iGPU as well. Those four XE cores are putting in work with more than double the performance of last gen. Unfortunately, AMD CPUs don't support OpenVINO. They use Windows ML. And in that race, <laughs> they beat Intel's CPU scores. However, in most cases on Intel, you won't be using Windows ML. So depending on your use case, these new NPUs might really matter to you. Because, I don't know, you can afford a brand new CPU and motherboard, but not a GPU? I don't know, we'll have to see how developers use these things. What could actually be a factor for you is power. While our 285K peaked at 250 watts to top the charts earlier, it only averaged 218, which is a 33 watt drop from the 14900K. To be clear, Intel is still clearly juicing their chips harder than AMD, but at least it's finally coming down, and it looks even better when we compare our 245K to the 14600K. Less power, higher score. You'll love to see it. It's just too bad that AMD twisted the knife on their most recent launch. It's also just not that clear of an improvement. We looked at Intel's best case for performance per watt in gaming earlier, but in our usual process for power and thermal testing, we use F123, and gen over gen, it's more of a mixed bag here. Yeah, they're using fewer watts on both SKUs, but surprisingly, they're running a few degrees hotter. So it looks like, unless they're using significantly less power, you can expect a pretty similar operating temperature. But hey, at least you can reuse your old cooler with the new LGA 1851 socket? Oh yeah, I only briefly mentioned this before. If you want these new chips, you're gonna need a new motherboard. Sick. Truly guys, I don't remember the last launch that left me this disappointed. I mean, there is a ton of cool stuff here to get excited about, like the potential prediction improvements thanks to removing SMT and the new knobs and dials for overclocking. Leaks have even popped up showing the 285K reaching over 350 watts for an alleged 8.5% performance gain. It's just too bad that the majority of you guys watching this video are probably never gonna try your hand at overclocking beyond enabling XMP on your RAM anyway. Speaking of RAM, big changes there. We're getting CU DIMM support and a DDR5 only memory controller. 
Intel told us that these CPUs should see some decent gains when cranking up the speed to 8,000 megatransfers per second or greater, which sounds pretty cool, except that ours completely refused to do it, so we weren't able to verify their claims. Stay tuned though. Maybe now that both AMD and Intel have settled on DDR5, we'll have to test a wide range of memory speeds on both platforms in the not too distant future. Maybe an update or two in the meantime will fix Intel's issues in time for that. Which leaves us with one last kick in the teeth. When we started writing this review, the Ryzen 9 9950X was scarce and prices were high. But as of the weekend before the embargo lift, the 9950X went on sale for as low as $599. That didn't last long, and at the time of filming, they're already back to the $700 range, but it's a good way to get us started on the conversation about pricing. Today, you can buy a Core Ultra 9 285K for $589. You're also gonna need a new motherboard that supports the new 1851 socket, and realistically, probably some new DDR5 memory if you wanna try to get faster speeds out of it. The Ultra 7 265K? Probably the chip that actually matters in this launch, and unfortunately, the one we have zero benchmarks for, it costs almost 200 bucks less at 394, and the Ultra 5 245K is 309. Considering that Arrow Lake isn't a drop-in replacement, it is really hard to get excited about this pricing when we look at the competition, especially when we consider that the Ryzen 7 9800X3D is rumored to be released next month. Intel's calling Arrow Lake a reset on the desktop roadmap, and I guess I'm just hoping that that's true, and that this is a Zen 1 moment. Like that was a major change with some real improvements, but it wasn't that competitive. The real competitiveness came later with Zen 2 and especially Zen 3. So for Intel right now, unless you're super keen on an NPU on desktop or you're one of those people who still thinks that AMD is Kirkland brand Intel, it's really hard for me to find a reason to buy these. If you do want to pick one up, we'll have it and all the CPUs that we tested linked in the description down below. As always, I'm your host, Linus Sebastian, and this is a segue. To today's sponsor. Squarespace! Have you ever checked out our beautiful website? We built it from the ground up with Squarespace. They make building a website easy with Squarespace Blueprint, a tool designed to give you great layouts and styling options so your site is optimized for every device. And with their Fluid Engine Editor, you can easily customize those layouts thanks to a code-free drag and drop approach. They also have integrated and optimized SEO tools that help your site rank higher in search results. And if you plan on selling products, Squarespace accepts credit cards, PayPal, and even Apple pay to give your customers flexibility. Start building your website today and use offer code LTT for 10% off at squarespace.com LTT. If you guys enjoyed this video, you might want to check out our review of the 7800X3D. Who knows what the 9800X3D will have in store for gamers, but boy has this line been a very exciting one to watch.